So I was on vacation. Um, Chris and I spoke briefly. Was that Chris was taking the committee through um, basically line by line the master plan uh, goals and objectives. So I think she's prepared to continue that discussion today uh, for as long as you would like to do that. It appears to be the bulk of your agenda to continue with the master plan today. Chris and I also, we have another meeting coming up at four. I can be a few minutes late to it, but um, she does need to leave probably at five of four to get to that meeting. Okay. Okay, and I'll, I'll mention that Pat mentioned we need to talk about process, but I think that um, I would like to go back to the master plan, and of course my question really has to do with how we're doing it and what we're doing it and what we're going to come up with. Um, there, have, there are no minutes available for the last meeting, so if I could ask for a brief review, um, Chris, and then with comments from Andy and Pat of what we did discuss at that last meeting, I think that would be... Very helpful. Oh, thank you. I think you do Meeting before I think it would be the last one for them. No. I'm not doing that. I see I mean that's what it's for this this guy goes first and the time is so and so I can I can try. Oh I see. Okay. It's just my So I can, I can kind of summarize my notes. I haven't yeah. actually read them since last time, but I can summarize them, comments that people made. I tried to write down as much as I could about uh, what you thought about the master plan or where you thought it needed to go, and um, then I'll talk about the individual items. So Mr. Steinberg um, commented on a number of things. Um, he wanted to make sure that everybody knew about the housing production plan and the housing market study and that they should be incorporated into the master plan. I think the at least the housing market study, I believe, has been incorporated by reference by the planning board, but I can um, check that. I'll check the minutes. Um, he mentioned the fact that the demographics of Amherst have changed since the last, since the master plan was written. The master plan was really completed by about 2008, and then it was um, edited and tweaked until it was finally adopted by the planning board in February of 2010. So certainly our demographics have changed somewhat since 2008. We also have a census that's coming up in 2020. So that's something to keep in mind as we uh, move forward and, and work on the master plan. Um, Mr. Steinberg mentioned that there was falling school enrollment, which is part of our uh, situation, our new situation that we're gonna need to deal with and that the population, the age of our population is increasing. Um, it's also increasingly difficult for families to start uh, here in Amherst owning homes because the price of real estate is so expensive. Uh, Mr. Steinberg mentioned climate change as an important issue that probably uh, wasn't as much in the forefront in um, the 2000s as it is now in almost 2020 and that we really need to incorporate um, reference to the climate change and what we're gonna do about it um, and that uh, he mentioned also that some forms of renewables are, are not clean, and so we have to think about that. Um, bio, what do they call it, biomass? Yeah. Biomass is something that we could call into question. Um, he mentioned that technology is changing rapidly, and that's certainly true. I don't know how, if everybody had cell phones back in 2008, 2010, but that's certainly a difference. Um, we, we have many references to the select board and town meeting in our master plan, and those need to be uh, changed to a new form of government. Um, so I guess his final conclusion was that the facts in the master plan need to be made clear and correct. So we need to at least go through and edit uh, the language. Um, let's see. I'm th looking at things that Mr. Shriver said. Um, he also talked about the factual, factual underpinnings of the master plan and that, that it was important to make sure that everything was brought up to date. Um, Ms. DeAngelis mentioned current inf information about demographics. I think that our uh, population has um, changed to be more diverse as time has gone on, and that's something that needs to be uh, recognized, and we need more affordable as well as market rate housing. 
and moderate rate housing. She mentioned that that was an important factor that sometimes we forget when we're con having conversations about housing. Um, how do we address the needs of moderate income families? And what can be built for those who have moderate income? And that's a question because developers don't generally want to build something for that price range. They don't get any um, fina fi um, tax incentives for building the low income housing and then they don't make as much money selling or renting. Um, Ms. McGowan um, mentioned the master plan is really, the bulk of it was done in, in 2006. Um, there was no implementation body set up and we recognize that. Um, the planning board um, was called upon to have representatives on a, on a master plan implementation committee and they were already working very hard on all their own subcommittees so they declined to participate and the select board um, didn't uh, didn't assign anyone to an implementation committee, so that's potentially something that you want to take on. Um, so parts of the master plan have been implemented and parts haven't. Um, and Ms. McGowan mentioned that we haven't, we didn't implement, implement it in a systematic way, which is certainly true. Um, when I go through the items one by one, you'll see that you know most of these items are fairly broad in scope and we have achieved uh, parts of them, but not, um, we haven't achieved them completely. Um, and she mentioned in, that inclusionary zoning is not in the master plan. Even though I believe inclusionary zoning had been adopted by the time the master plan was signed, but I don't think there's any reference to it in the master plan. So that's something that we need to address. Um, let's see. Um, Ms. McGowan uh, stated that she feels that um, we should be requiring a 15 percent of all new developments be affordable. Um, let's see. I'm trying to remember what everybody said. Mr. Steinberg moved that the CRC recommend, oh, that was about the public way. Yeah, so that was Nate's item on the dog park. Um, so we have a lot of plans that are now considered to be part of the master plan, but they're really not, I don't believe, listed anywhere. And those would include the open space and recreation plan, the transportation plan, the housing market study, and there are probably other plans out there. Um, they were talked about during planning board meetings and incorporated by a vote of the planning board, but I don't think that we have actually listed them, so that would be an important thing to do. Um, Mr. Schreiber stated that parts of the master plan were actually old by the time they were written, which is also probably true. Um, so our form of government has changed, and that's very significant. Um, we need to have an implementation committee to track what has been implemented and what hasn't. Um, let's see what else. Oh, uh, the other thing Mr. Schreiber mentioned, and I think the planning board is particularly aware of this, is that the downtown was very different when the master plan was written. Mm -hmm. um, I think the Boltwood Place was built in 2010, so that was yeah. either just being started or you know there was talk about that building back in that era, but none of the other um, big buildings had been built. Um, the uh, development on University Drive and Northampton Road and all the new things that we're seeing, we, we didn't have any sense that those were coming along back then. Um, Ms. McGowan recommended that there be a low interest loan program available to families who want to buy houses in Amherst. And someone else mentioned that two family houses are a good idea and we should allow them in all parts of town. Ms. McGowan men mentioned a group called Nesterly that has begun in Cambridge where um, I think it's an online organization that puts students and young people together with empty nesters to make housing more affordable for young people. Um, someone said, I think it was Pat DeAngelis said, the core values in the master plan are good. So I appreciate that. <laughs> the basic master plan is good. We have to tweak the details. Um, we talked about what the role of the planning board is via vis-a-vis via, -vis the master plan because the planning board is designated by state law to uh, create the master plan, but our town charter says that the um, town council will, I don't know if it's adopt or approve, I can't remember which word was used, but certainly the town council has a, has a role in this. 
Is it review and approve? Is that it? I think it was approve, but uh, the adopt was the role of the planning board by statute. Mm -hmm. So Ms. DeAngelis mentioned that she thought it would be good to have working groups that would work on different aspects of the master plan, people who are interested in different topics. Um, and I think Ms. DeAngelis mentioned that she's particularly interested in housing. Um, someone else wanted to have a permanent farmer's market. That may have been Sarah Schwartz. And oh, we talked about what are the edges of the village centers? That's always been kind of a nebulous thing. We had a map in here last time I came in, um, and there are circles on the map that show, you know, what the core of the village center is, and then show what I think it's like a 15-minute walk from the center of the village center. But that's always been a question: where exactly mm -hmm. are the village centers, and where are we talking about um, developing more densely? Mm -hmm. And perhaps the land use policy map needs needs to be adjusted. Um, and then uh, someone whose initials are CS, I can't remember who that is, I probably should, but um, <laughs> said that we should connect transportation with village center planning. Oh, that's Kathy Shane. Kathy Shane, yeah. thank you. She spoke from the audience. That's yes. why I was not She's, remembering. She, she, she attends all CRC meetings. Okay. So that's, that was an important item I've got. Yeah, repeat it, please. Um, Kathy Shane said we needed to connect transportation with village center planning, and I do think that's very important. Of course, we have a lot of transportation options in the downtown, but that's not necessarily true of some of our village centers. So I don't know if any of you have had a chance to do more reading, if you have more questions about the master plan, or if you just want me to launch into um, continuing on with what I was talking about last time. I have a, a couple of questions. Um, the master plan mentions sustainability, but it is not clear to me what it means by that. Um, yeah. I think that's a good question. I think that was something that was a, a, it's a popular word that's kind of tossed around and it means a lot of different things. Yeah. Um, we have now a sustainability coordinator, Stephanie Ciccarello, and Stephanie was she was working on uh, alternative energy sources back at the time the master plan was done, but I don't know if her focus was so much on sustainability in general, but now it is. So um, it, it is going to become more of a topic, and I think what it means is that we don't want to use our resources um, glibly. We want to preserve our resources, use them in a way that is the least destructive to the environment, and there are probably ways that we need to do that w that we don't know about and and perhaps you would want to speak to stephanie at some point about what efforts she's making i think she's the staff person for the energy mm -hmm. and e ecac is that what you call it yeah ecac ecac so yeah. she's the person who would be most knowledgeable about that topic if that's something that you wanted to hear more about well i i know that we have net zero for town built buildings and we have no requirements for privately built buildings, and as Andy points out, it has to be economically viable for them to do it. So uh, there may be that, and this is you know just off the top of my head, but some town structure of incentives to the private developers to include you know solar power or whatever to to think about and maybe spend some extra money, uh, maybe heat exchange pumps or some of the things that are really reducing energy use um, since we don't really, I don't, there may be federal programs, but I don't even know what programs are left anymore. Mm -hmm. But I see Dave looking, he's got a hand there. Sure, so I think this is an excellent question and a, um, you know, pausing here for a minute to say, when we move into revisions of the current master plan, clearly this section and anything related to sustainability needs to be, um, expanded greatly. It, it's fascinating to me to think that back in 2010, mm -hmm. to be honest, we weren't, a lot of, the, the, the general public was not talking about global climate change uh, back in 2010. There were many researchers and people who were well, well advanced of, mm -hmm. of the rest of the world saying, wow, we've got a problem. But look at how far we've come in nine or 10 years 
and now it is on the forefront of everyone's consciousness. So clearly this document, the original um, master plan, didn't speak to that, and I think there's ways working with Stephanie and the ECAC that we can bring much more into a revised, uh, a revised document. Um, and we're looking at sustainability across the board, as Chris said, we're looking at, um, we're looking at energy consumption, we're looking at carbon uh, footprint, we're even looking at um, runoff and pollution. And you know, many people might think in, in today's Amherst that we have a handle on, on stormwater and that we're doing a good job with stormwater. I, we're, you know, I, might, I don't want to hazard a guess as to how we're doing on stormwater, what, what I would give us for a grade. We're not failing, but we're not getting an A. Um, and most communities aren't. So what's going into every time it rains, where does that stormwater go? What does it contribute to pollution in the Mill River, Fort River, and the Connecticut River? So there's a lot we can do in terms of sustainability. Agriculture um, and how much food and resiliency is all part of that sustainability. How much food do we grow in Amherst? How much food can we grow in Amherst? We have over 2,000 acres of farmland protected in Amherst. How much of that farmland is actually growing food? as opposed to growing, some of it might grow tobacco, or trees, or shrubs, or other non-food um, non related items. Um, so anyway, there's lots that we can do in this, that category. Um, I have one small thing. Uh, are we supposed to be recording it? We are recording it. We you are. see it says the recording on it. Oh, great. The time's moving. Thank you. Excellent. So I wanted to mention the fact that even though um, there's not a net zero requirement for new buildings in town, many of the developers are choosing to develop their buildings and try to achieve LEED certification and various levels of LEED certification. So that is really in the forefront of many people's minds. And often when you see an architect's name, they prominently display that they're a member of the AIA, American Institute of Architects, and that they have LEED certification. So that is becoming a very um, hot topic. Okay, so I think we left off. Oh, I sorry. Yeah. Yep. So uh, just to answer one question and then uh, go back to one small piece just to get the record complete. Uh, section 9.8, I'm looking at the charter. Uh, uh, 9.8C, no, B is adoption, the master plan or any amendments thereto shall be approved by the planning board and then be submitted to, by the town manager to the town council, which will hold, shall hold at least one public hearing thereon. The town council shall adopt the master plan with or without amendments. So uh, it arises from the planning board, but it's adoption, so it's, uh, Charter Section 9.8B. Um, and the other thing that I was, I, uh, when Mr. Schreiber brought up the question about the historic nature of downtown, and uh, it coincided with the note that I had in when I did my review of the plan. And when you're looking on page, uh, on under land use, 3.3, uh, I think it's uh, A, emphasize preservation of historic areas of downtown village centers and other uh, specific districts and residential areas, key resource areas. Uh, but my note that I wrote next to that is, what are significant historical aspects of downtown? because it says emphasize preservation of the historic areas of downtown. Mm -hmm. um, I think that we recognize that some things may be viewed as historic and some things not as historic and uh, that that was a piece that might benefit from more exploration. Yes. So we do have an, a new local historic district that is to the west of downtown and that was established in order to um, protect the historic character of that neighborhood. Um, I understand that the local historic district commission is interested in exploring other areas of town to 
establish as local historic districts, so perhaps they would want to look at the downtown and see what historic aspects of the downtown they would want to preserve. Can you give me um, some guidance about where this new historic district is so I could reference it in a minute? It's called the Lincoln Sunset Local Historic District, so it's in the Lincoln Sunset neighborhood. I think it stretches up to Fearing Street and down to Amity Street, Amity. roughly. Yeah. So, I think the, uh, yeah. well, but there is one problem with that. The, the group wanted to include the west side of uh, North Pleasant Street and were not able to get that done. And that's one of the areas, when we talk about where is the edge of the downtown center, uh, there's kind of a, and I believe that street is uh, zoned light business at this time. And um, it's one of these things that, that the local history district was in terms of not every house is a historic house, but it was to do with the character of the neighborhood and the history of the neighborhood. And when you look at that stretch of houses, uh, not all of them are absolutely beautiful, but the stretch is very New England. And at this moment, that may be the only thing that would be left to denote, oh, this is an old New England town down here. So that is one of the areas of concern um, right now, that, that that particular stretch, and I know that it, it's a place of possible development. I'm going to give up my seat. No, no, you're going to keep turning. Oh, no. Yes. Well, I'll let you get, get yourself settled. But uh, The other thing that uh, I had brought up last time was that uh, as a way of an example, uh, the Historic Commission had had a debate about whether what was the most recently the Bertucci's restaurant that was really a building built as a 1950s era Chrysler dealership. dealership was really an historic building or not. And what constitutes an historic building is therefore uh, what the question is, is a 1950s era car dealership historic? Uh, and uh, that was the uh, piece that we were, that, that I was thinking about that we need to have dialogue Yes. I just wanted to say that um, technically or the way we observe things is that anything that's over 50 years old is considered to be historic. So pretty much all of Echo Hill would be considered to be historic, which I think is funny because I live in a 1960s yeah. you know, cape in Echo Hill. <laughs> I don't think of it as historic. But anyway, that's the technical definition so, uh, t as of today. And more than 50 years old. So 50 years, anything that's more than 50 years old. And the Historical Commission has um, talked about changing that uh, policy to be anything that's older than 75 years old. But they haven't actually changed the policy. So do you, um, I was interested in Ms. Pam's comments about um, the west side of Kendrick Park, yeah. which is also the west side of North Pleasant Street, and the fact that that was not included in the local historic district. And I think that the intent there was that um, people wanted to have some flexibility to perhaps develop that area. Um, it is, some of it is in the limited business district, and I think some of it might be in the RG, but the feeling was that that was so close to the center of town mm -hmm. that they didn't want to you know, completely rule out the development of some of those properties. So I just wanted to mention that because Mr. Schreiber is here and he was probably part of that conversation when it was before the planning board. And, and Janet McGowan has her hand up. Um, and knows a lot more about this. Thank you. So I was in town meeting during that vote and had talked to some people who had worked, spent hours and hours doing all the research on those houses. They wanted to include those houses and they couldn't do it politically and get support for the um, districts. So they dropped them out. And so that was said on the floor of town meeting. They wanted to put it in, but they couldn't get it. And then even if it was in the historic district, it doesn't mean that those houses can't be touched. And so they just, any, any changes to them would have to go through the historic commission and it could you know keep the look of it so they could get bigger, they could get taller. 
they might have to keep the facades or, or the materials that are used would have to be in conformity with the look of it. But the houses themselves were um, considered a part of the district. Also, Kendrick Park had a whole bunch of houses on it. And so, um, you know, when you look at the edge of downtown, or that question is, you know, those used to be residential houses there too. So um, I think that was a political decision, not a historic or, you know, history decision. And so that doesn't have to stay. It, but it also is true that changes to historical districts um, further political ends. So I think that we need to know what we're going for. Um, I think anything can be used in both directions. Okay, the language that uh, Janet McGowan was using uh, is, is really interesting, and I, and I would kind of like to see some of that um, in the plan that when we're talking about pre preserving the character of a New England town, um, it doesn't always have to be the exact old buildings, but the character can mean houses uh, made, out of some, made out of wood or some other, because there, there's one or two houses in that strip that I think are newer, but are done beautifully. Um, uh, it could be two family, but not uh, yes. things that are totally alien to the character of a New England town. I think it's really important, and I think it was an intent. It's in the master plan many times, retaining character, um, that is there. So I think that we have to figure out how to do that. It's, it's really complex. We're not gonna be doing it on the other side of the park. Um, that is not gonna look like a New England town. Um, no matter what it turns out to be in the space between the two new buildings, it's not going to, and there's no, that's no, no point in fighting for that, because that it wouldn't fit but it is the edge of a local history district, so it seems an appropriate place to at least be a, a transitional, in some way, uh, area. Dave. A small related point, but one could argue, a planner could argue that the east side of North Pleasant Street, perhaps many parts of it, even before the larger, taller buildings, didn't look like a traditional New England town, because much of it is or was one story 1950s construction. Mm -hmm. um, even up through the Zana block, one could argue, you know, mm -hmm. before Kendrick Park and Winnie yeah. So it's interesting that clearly the, the look and feel of the west side of North Pleasant is dramatically and has been, you know, very different for many, many years. Yeah. So, yeah. you know. Um, the so whole, yeah, the, the area history near, sometimes yeah. gets in the way of, of, of desire yeah. sometimes, yeah. It, it, we probably lost the east side when the tannery, there was a tannery there, um, uh, hence the name Tan Brook. And uh, yeah. I know Jonathan Tucker might have remembered that building. I don't remember that building being there, but there was uh, a couple of buildings where, where Kendrick Park is now, uh, Kendrick Place is now. Well, th there, is, there has been some talk that there needs to be a, um, a reinvestigation of the water levels uh, behind the buildings there because of the tan brook and that it may not in fact be suitable for large development because of um, the water there um, and there's the, if you look at the maps there's weird squiggles and kind of vague areas behind that row of houses yes we're pretty aware of where the tan brook is there it's all undergrounded from almost almost strong street much of the tan brook has been been uh, put underground and, and piped, but um, it's all there. Right, because uh, there is yeah. a stream where some students drowned a few years ago that um, it's called an intermittent stream, but the people who live near there say it is not intermittent. Is that on the uh, It's uh, over, uh, over yeah. near McClellan where Tanbrook Daylights yeah. probably, yeah. yeah. I mean, th these are things that people have been telling me in the last couple yeah. months, so I'm you not, know a lot more than I do. I'm not aware that anybody has drowned in that yeah, part, but I student could be. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so anyway, do you want to continue? Chris, with, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So as far as I know, we ended on page 3.9 of the text of the um, master plan in the land use section, and I think we were about to start talking about um, objective LU.3, which is preserve key undeveloped lands. And... Um, so Amherst, uh, I think, is doing a really good job at preserving 
key on developed lands. Maybe Mr. Schreiber has something to say about that. No, I'm sorry, I'm trying to catch up. Please, where, where are we? We're in this land use section of the text. We had started going through the uh, chart at the yeah. end of the matrix, but it proved to be um, that the matrix didn't exactly match the yeah. text of the, of the master plan, so we shifted back to the text. So where I have a note that we stopped the last time was on page 3.9 of the text, and in the middle of the page, there's objective L3. Sorry, that was. And it's, um, there's a, a, a big bold note there, preserve key undeveloped oh, lands. Yep. So um, as we all know, Amherst does place a high value on unique landscapes and natural resources, and I'm glad that Mr. Zomek is here to talk about that. We did um, have a lot of uh, mention about various um, lands in Amherst in the Open Space and Recreation Plan, lands that were already preserved and lands that are um, being contemplated to be preserved. And um, the Conservation Department, in combination with the Planning Department, um, usually applies for um, some CPAC funds every year and also funds from the state to preserve lands. And I don't know if you want to go through each of these uh, items, but um, I, I believe that an inventory was done as part of the Open Space and Recreation Plan. So that would be LU.3.A. Um, and evaluation of resource lands on the basis of environmental quality risk and connectivity, that's probably been done to some degree, but perhaps not uh, thoroughly. Um, identify areas to preserve, areas where a varying combination of preservation and development should occur, and areas to allow development with only modest controls. So this is something that um, we don't always know when lands are going to be coming along. For instance, the Hickory Ridge Country Club, we didn't really have any reason to believe that that was going to be a piece of land that was available to the town for um, acquisition, uh, say, 10 years ago when the master plan was put together. Now we understand that um, because of some uh, environmental issues, climate change, as well as a lack of interest in um, golfing or a lowered interest in golfing, that um, golf course has not been as successful as the owners hoped. And so the town is actually doing just this um, trying to purchase that property for preservation of part of the land, um, for development of part of it for solar panels, and then perhaps um, allowing some other uses to occur along the frontage. And I don't know if you want to hear any more about that, but um, that is being done. Ms. McGowan. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I couldn't hear you, Jim. I see you. So this is the section that always fires me up. So. Um, I wanted to know, like, when I read this section, I would think that you would inventory all the natural areas and open land and make an assessment of them and then decide, okay, how do they need to be protected? Do we need to, you know, if it's, if it's zoned for too intensively, should we change the zoning? Should we put these, these lands, you know, high risk or high priority for acquisition? Um, so that's like a big management thing. And so has that been done? That would be a question to ask Mr. Zomek, but I think it has been at least partially done in the Open Space and Recreation Plan. So, yeah, I'd be happy to address that if it's okay with the chair or the vice chair. Yes, totally. <laughs> so, yeah, I think a lot of this is, is referenced in the Open Space and Recreation Plan um, and, and has been for many years. Um, Different parts of town have been assessed over the last 50 years for their environmental resources, for their sensitivity. Um, I'll give a couple of quick examples because I know at one of your previous meetings, I went through kind of the open space section of the master plan in a little more detail, but I know we're going through the goals and objectives. But um, uh, for instance, you know, the Mount Holyoke Range has for many years been identified as a priority because for a number of reasons. It's uh, contiguous with other state lands, it's of high scenic value, it's of high uh, rare and endangered species value, um, recreational value for trails and running and hiking, et cetera, et cetera. Likewise, Lawrence Swamp was a high priority because it is um, uh, the source of much of our drinking water. Um, so the Open Space and Recreation Plan uh, basically draws big uh, large uh, um, 
blocks around different parts of town, agricultural land, for instance. So some more current, if you will, and, and kind of speaking to, to what's changed, as Chris just did about since 2010. So one of the areas that's identified uh, in our open space and recreation plan are the agricultural lands associated with Hampshire College. So when the master plan was uh, finished in 2010 and the open space plan was updated in 2017-18, we really didn't know much at all about Hampshire's situation. Fast forward to today. Well, clearly the agricultural lands, Hampshire is the holder of about 650 acres of land in Amherst, and those lands, much of them are farmed. So they are of a high priority for preservation. Um, not the core campus, not the residential areas, but the agricultural lands. So I think in answer to Janet's question, all over town we have identified resource areas um, that we believe should be protected. Now I will put this in the context that Amherst has been and continues to be a leader in open space preservation. So realistically, and I've said this at many meetings, our acquisition of open space, I think our program is going to be ramping down over the next, call it five to 10 years. I don't see us you know, purchasing another uh, 1,500 acres of open space. There, frankly, there just isn't that much land left to protect in Amherst. If you take out the land of UMass, of Amherst College, mm -hmm. Hampshire College, again, I've identified some of the farmland, but we've protected thousands of acres of open space for water supply, for trails, for places like Puffer's Pond. We've protected most of the farmland that needs to be protecting, protected. So we're gonna be ramping down our acquisition program and ramping up our management program. We do need to do a better job at managing our conservation lands. Um, we need more resources. We have bridges, we have trails, we have um, a habitat that we wanna manage. Uh, we have dams, we own dams. We need to maintain those dams and dikes. So all of that needs to happen. So, so I, think, I think we've done a lot of that, Janet. I think the, we've also identified the village centers as places for growth and density to happen. Um, are there lands that are in private hands that the zoning of it threatens the land, the, use, the protection of the land? Um, I guess before Chris speaks, I guess I would say that in general, I think our zoning for the most part has been developed to complement and, and work in concert with open space efforts. So there are places, for instance, that are zoned outlying residential, low density, and have a farmland overlay. So clearly that's an indication that the town thought that farmland should, as much of that farmland should be protected as possible. There may be some houses developed on that parcel, parcel A, B, or C in that area, but um, to do that, you're going to need to protect some of that land. Does that mean we need to buy that land to protect it? Probably not. So, so Chris can speak more to the zoning piece than I can, but. Um, Pat, did you still have your question? No, that's right. Okay. Um, I do have the follow-up to uh, that, because I wrote down in my notes here, er, under areas for development. Are there any areas for development besides the village centers? Because we, we've talked about uh, moderate income housing. We've talked about the need for some moderate ho homes that people can buy. Um, and we've talked about cluster zoning, and there's been some informal conversations about that. But one of the questions I have is, is there any land that would be suitable for that? Or any land, say, even that the town owned, that they could give to as a way of, of, of uh, helping pay for, encourage such a development? Well, a couple of thoughts on that. One is that we are, right before the select board um, rode off into the sunset, they adopted a policy, um, uh, a real surplus property policy, which I think you all may have gotten copies of. So that policy calls for the town manager to pull together a group of staff 
to look at all the town property, everything we own in Amherst, and assess its value to the town. Conservation land, watershed land, right-of-ways, parks, commons, schools, everything the town owns, not the region, that's mm -hmm. the region's property, but Wildwood, Crocker Farm, Fort River, Southeast Street Campus, the South Amherst Campus, all of those are part of this inventory that we have. And this surplus real property group would then assess and say, well, this 20-acre parcel in, in Lawrence Swamp is, is providing clean water. We're not about to put anything on it in our lifetime, maybe beyond, because it's helping us to produce a sustainable water source. But what about the, let's take um, East Street School. That property has been owned by the town for a long time. The schools surplused it to the town. And so the Affordable Housing Trust approached the select board before the select board rode off into the sunset and said, boy, we'd really like to look at that property for dense affordable housing. At the time, the select board said yes. Um, so now it's incumbent upon this group that includes myself and Chris and, and Guilford Mooring and Jeff Kravitz and, and we'll be at the, um, you know, we'll be working at the direction of the town manager. Our goal, our job is to look at all the property the town owns and say, are there properties that could be used for something else? Affordable housing, um, could any of those properties be sold to get back on the tax roll? So I guess that's the long way of answering your question. Yeah. Yes, we may have property that could provide affordable housing. I will tell you this, the town doesn't own a lot of land yeah. that is just doing nothing mm -hmm. and is unencumbered. We're not like a big city, Springfield, Worcester, Boston, Chicopee, they often have these lands in village centers that can, they may have derelict houses on them that can be demoed and new housing can be built. We're not that, yeah. but we're gonna do the best we can to look at that, so. Okay, anyone here? Okay, yes, Chris. So I just brought the land use policy map in here so that you get a sense of where everything is in relation to its, each other. Um, I'm gonna bring it over here and try to use the microphone while I'm pointing to the map. Just a minute, please. You can see the um, downtown and the village centers and the developed parts of town are colored yellow on this map. So those are the places where we already have development. Um, there's a lot of green on the map in outlying areas, particularly on the, um, the, uh, the east side of town and in the southern part of town. Some of that is already protected by uh, agricultural protection um, restrictions, et cetera but much of that land is also zoned um, for development. And a question came up at last, I think it was last year's, 2018 rather, uh, town meeting, whether we should look at certain parts of North Amherst that are zoned for 30,000 square foot lots and consider upzoning that land to, or downzoning it I guess, to uh, 80,000 square foot lots. So that's something that the planning board has on its list of things to do. And the reason it was brought to the planning board's attention was because of um, a particular development that was pr proposed up there that was proposing wells and septic t systems on the same lots. And so the question was, is 30,000 square feet big enough to have both a well and a septic system? So that's something that it's on the list of the planning board to look at. And that's in response to Ms. Uh, Ms. Pam's question about whether there are lands out there that are developable. Those lands are developable, but people are kind of pushing them to be developed in a less dense manner than um, in a more dense manner. So mm -hmm. there's a kind of push-pull here. We know we need more housing. We know we want to have housing close to itself, but there are uh, potentially environmental reasons or other reasons why we don't want to have that in our outlying areas. So that's a conversation that we're going to have to have as we go along and, and look at, start to look at zoning. In, in a sense, what I hear you saying and I just, is that, you know, that the areas that can be developed need to be looked at very individualistically to determine, and then zoning changes would be made to address that. That makes good sense. 
go forward? Shall we continue? Yes. Okay. So on the next page, um, I think it's page 3.10, um, we talk about purchasing the most critical natural resource properties. So Ms. McGowan um, brought that topic up uh, prior to our looking at this particular item. And I think Mr. Zomek has responded to it that we do uh, have critical resource areas on our list of places to purchase, but there aren't that many of them left. Um, however, when areas do become available, like Hickory Ridge Country Club, uh, Golf Club, we do move to try to preserve them. The next one is revised growth management regulations, zoning, subdivision regulations, health regulations to protect environmental resources and scenic view sheds. So that's something that we do need to do. Um, I don't think we've looked at the subdivision regulations since the late 90s. We've been meaning to do that, but we just haven't gotten around to it. There are um, particular things that we can do to protect some of our environmental resources by um, shifting our zoning, just like I was talking about earlier, but that needs to be studied. The next one is revise zoning overlay districts for aquifer, watershed, and farmland resources. Create a zoning overlay district for critical forest resource areas. And we do have um, zoning overlay districts for the aquifer. We have an aquifer re recharge district down in South Amherst. Um, we do have watershed, a watershed district up in North Amherst around the Atkins Reservoir. Um, and we do have a farmland conservation overlay district um, that's been established over a lot of the RO and RLD uh, properties in the outlying areas. So I think we have accomplished that. Um, we have not, as far as I know, um, done anything with zoning, with a zoning overlay to preserve forest resources. Um, so that's pot potentially something that we would want to work on. Um, moving along on page 3.11, um, there's a, an objective that states protect key farmland and farming in Amherst. And I think we have made a lot of strides to protect farmland and farming. We have huge swaths of land along both northeast and southeast street that have been protected with um, agricultural preservation restrictions. There was one that was recently added at the Hurl Farm in South Amherst. It's on the east side of Southeast Street. It's where the big yellow house and yellow barn are. And I think there's about 62 acres of, of preserved land there. So we're continuing to work with the state to protect um, farmland. Um, a strategy that's listed under this objective is to provide incentives to encourage sustainable or green farming and forestry practices. Um, again, probably Mr. Zomek would be better able to speak to that particular item if he, if he chooses to speak and if he's recognized. Yes, please, Mr. Zomek. I don't have a lot to say on that. I think, I think we have a long way to go to help Amherst farmers be more profitable and greener. Um, I've said this for a number of years, and it's really just a question of time and energy and resources, but you know, we, we have a wonderful land base of protected farmland, but there are agricultural properties that are protected that are probably not performing at their highest level, and there's a number of reasons for that. Um, some of our farms are actually, that were protected early in the APR's history, our APR program history, uh, don't have the greatest soils um, for growing things that are needed today and, and valued, like um, vegetables. Vegetable crops are very high value right now, and many of our APRs were dairy farms. And so as dairy went out, um, there, it's hard to kind of backfill and replace those lost dairy farms with other things, particularly if the soil isn't quite right. So I think there's a bottom line is there's a lot we could do to more to support our Amherst farms through farmers markets, CSAs. Um, I will say one thing the town did do recently, and I'm not gonna get the verbiage on this right, but the town did work with farmers to create, and Andy may uh, recall this, uh, the select board worked on this, to create a split rate for um, water use and allow uh, a meter to be used for the home 
lot or the home um, building and then allow a separate meter for, um, for um, and I, I think it was more metering than rate, but allow a different meter if you're going to irrigate your crops. So there's some things we can do to help farmers be more profitable. Yeah, to be real quick in supplementing that, what it was about is that the way that um, sewer rates are charged to customers, it's dependent upon water usage. Um, the <coughs> Agricultural Commission was raising the question on behalf of some um, growers that use significant water that when you're watering for crop purposes, it's not water that returns to the sewage system, and therefore, uh, to be charged for the sewer cost of it um, was uh, something that they were raising. In the purpose of um, allowing a split so that uh, water that goes into a farm could be divided and um, between the agricultural and non-agricultural uses was to differentiate the water that was ultimately going back into the sewer system that would be charged the sewer fees and uh, to, in order to exempt the water that was being used for agricultural purposes uh, from having that additional charge. Yeah, and I, I think that this could be a place where we could clarify what we mean by farming. So like, what are the priorities of farming? So you had mentioned, what was it that you said about vegetables? Well, um, what we see happening in the valley is that vegetable farming, um, uh, boutique vegetable farming, for instance, growing greens um, year round in, in uh, high tunnels, essentially greenhouses, is getting more and more profitable. As, as restaurants and we all try to eat uh, more organic, uh, organically grown vegetables, that's a, a kind of a, a booming part of the agricultural side of things. Whereas dairy, although at one time we had 55 dairy farms in Amherst, we really only have one left. So I don't see dairy coming back into Amherst, but helping farmers to really work within the niches that they, they are profitable in, because that's what's gonna drive uh, uh, successful farmers is, is, is profit. So. so, so along those lines, yeah, so if you guys, bear with me here, but we have, uh, okay. we, we have somebody with, with um, a farming with, mother, a farming mother. Yes. But so food security is sort of, should be part of this conversation as should sustainability. So we know that, you know, basically, um, animal farming is a contributor to global warming. Growing vegetables mm -hmm. helps reduce the, you know, issues of food security. So I, I went to. I've never been to the actual NOFA, National um, Northeast Organic Farming oh. Association meeting until this year, and um, I went to one of the sessions on vegetable. I want to become a vegetable farmer now. <laughs> and I went to one of the sessions on that. And he talked about the profitability of that, in part because vegetable farming is not as, it's kind of, um, how did he explain this? That everyone wants good vegetables and they're willing to pay a premium for that as opposed to say milk or meat or something like that, which is really sort of controlled at a national scale, but vegetable mm -hmm. is much more of a local scale. Mm -hmm. So you're most, many people are willing to buy tomatoes that they know where they're grown and how they're grown at a much higher price than, say, supermarket tomatoes that, that are coming from a farm far away. But I also, during that same week, went to a hemp tour, hemp farming tour. So I did not wow. know how much hemp is being grown in this area um, versus marijuana, but, but hemp farming is you know, taking over a lot of crops. And that you could argue that it's a good thing, right? Because it's making these small farms giving them a base of stability, a cash flow. But you can also argue that it might be a bad thing because mm -hmm. that same hemp might be replacing tomatoes or carrots for you know, the, um, the food security issue. So I do think we have to be careful about not mm -hmm. supporting farming for farming's sake, but, mm -hmm. but particular kinds of farming that we think contribute to the good of, good of animals. Yeah. 
Yes. I have two things to add. I had a long talk with a person who's running a composting farm, and he said a lot of the soils um, are depleted because they were farmed for years, and that part of his effort is to compost food to, to you know, reinvigorate and strengthen soils, which actually what anim grazing animals, you know, you, you know, how a Brookfield farm, they move their animals across their fields um, to basically improve the soils. But I was also um, wanted to mention that the Harvard Forest um, Kestrel Trust and a group of land trusts are in this huge effort in New England to um, kind of help reforest New England, which is happening naturally, maintaining um, um, areas for development and limiting that, and at the same time looking to maybe do 30 to 40 percent of New England's food supply locally. And so it's kind of this whole effort um, they're putting together that maybe someone could do a presentation from, maybe um, Kristen DeBoer or, or the guy who's the head of the Harvard Forest. But it's a, it's a region-wide effort to sort of, you know, reduce carbon emissions, you know, concentrate development, you know, enhance forests, because the, the New England forest is like, takes as much carbon dioxide up as um, the Amazon. And so it does that in the spring, because it's a very young forest. And so there's sort of this, we could maybe kind of glue into that really exciting idea of you know really managing our lands and thinking about it sustainably. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to build on what Steve said um, and what Dave was saying. Uh, one thing that, and we've mentioned this before and Sarah's mentioned and agreed with it, that um, to encourage farming uh, to be profitable is we need to build our own um, commercial kitchen for our local farmers to use. Uh, they have one in Franklin County and it is so densely booked that my daughter has just made her own commercial kitchen, which they're working on. There's still some, some kinks that they're working on. And they think they will use most of the time because there's this huge growth now mm -hmm. in preserving locally grown products. And uh, there's this uh, Just Pickles in um, Greenfield. So the farmers locally are growing tons and tons of cucumbers. Mm -hmm. They're going to Greenfield. They're becoming pickles. And there's this whole move towards fermentation and kimchi. So it's a very active food scene, which has been nurtured by our local educational institutions. Uh, Hampshire and uh, UMass have had a big part in it. Um, and I think it's an area of, of really good possible growth. But if we had um, somehow maybe Hampshire County and maybe could, could work on getting uh, a commercial kitchen that would be more closer and would be accessible, because the, the need is there. And the farmers are being very creative. They're branching out into new products uh, as we speak. Anyone else here? Okay, forward. Okay, great. Um, so the next item that we would talk about would be, um, on, again, on page 3.11, revise and expand farming overlay districts and create new forestry districts. So we do have pretty extensive farmland conservation overlay districts. As I mentioned, they cover a lot of the land that is zoned RO and RLD in town. We do not have any uh, forestry district, so that's potentially something that we might want to work mm -hmm. on. I'm not exactly sure how that would work. The way the for, uh, farmland conservation works is that you can't develop in farmland conservation districts with a subdivision unless you build a s cluster subdivision. So the idea is that you would preserve a large portion of the land mm -hmm. and cluster the houses closer together. Um, the next one on page 3.12, uh, create regulations that protect and support farmers' interests. This is something that comes to our attention periodically because many farmers in town would like to be able to have events on their farms. They'd like to be able to have weddings and um, parties and different things like that occasionally. Um, right now, our zoning doesn't allow that, and so it's hard for them to... Um, manage, I mean, they can't really manage to do that unless it's a one-time event. So um, that might be something that we'd like to look into in our zoning to try to make it easier for uh, farmers to hold these events on their property. Um, okay, that's all I have to say about that one. Um, then, Chris? Yeah. Um, the farm that is out on uh, Route 9 as you're going towards Belcher Town that had the restaurant on it for a while. That was an accessory use, but it's zoned agriculture, which is why I think that the building never has been able to be reused for anything. 
So that one's zoned RN, residential neighborhood, um, and that makes it very difficult for um, any kind of commercial operation to happen there. And the, and the gentleman who developed that property um, claimed that much of, well, I think he had to have most of his produce grown on his land and then uh, sold in his restaurant, and for some reason he just couldn't make that happen. I think he also had a brewery um, in that location, but it just it didn't come together very well, and there hasn't been anyone who's been interested in taking over that property. But um, that's an example of how our zoning doesn't promote um, businesses for farmers. But then the other question is, do people along Northeast Street and Southeast Street and places that are very rural and beautiful want to have larger places like restaurants on their um, in their neighborhood, or is there a way that I, I think Mad Woman Farm was one that came to us at one point, and they have a big barn in the back of their house, and they wanted to be able to hold events there, um, educational events, seminars, things like that, perhaps dances once in a while, weddings, but that wasn't something that fit in with the. Um, with our zoning, and so we couldn't figure out how to allow that to happen. And mm -hmm. in that particular location, it could possibly happen without much um, interruption with, uh, with the neighbors, although you would still have traffic, you'd probably have signs, you'd probably have you know, decorations and things that would make it a, a visible mm -hmm. event happening. So we have to figure out a way of balancing the desires of farmers to hold these events with the needs of neighbors who might not want to be um, accosted by noise and traffic and things like that. I, I have a question. Um, I, I live on Southeast Street and um, by Mad Woman's Farms fields are behind me and a realtor knocked on my door one day and said, do you want to buy this field? And I said, well, not really because it's permanently protected so I get all the advantages without any work. And then um, he said, well, if you buy this field, you could, you know, basically open a brewery or, you know, brew pub, if, you know, this whole thing. And I, I was, I mean, I wasn't interested in doing that either, but is that possible? So if I owned farmland in an RN that I could develop a farm-related business? That's yes. That. There is something called a farm um, restaurant. Farm, I forget exactly farm what the, it's uh, in section five of the zoning bylaw, it's an accessory use. Um, it is very hard to qualify for that, it, and I think that was one of the things that the um, Maplewood Farm suffered from. They couldn't make the product that they were selling um, match the uh, percentage that was required to be grown on their property, and mm. it just didn't come together. So it could be that we look at the farmland restaurant section of the bylaw and try to loosen it up a bit to allow more mm -hmm. things to happen. So I think that's really um, something that we could do to help farmers to survive? Um, I, I suggest that um, an information process be done with local farmers and the zoning um, planning board. And because right now there's a lot of creativity going on all over the place and new ideas coming up. And find out what they're doing, what they want to do, what they might want to do in the future. Because I don't think that we, most of us, really imagine what they're up to, but they're up to a lot. Because um, I think we should encourage I think it makes an interesting town, an interesting place, if there are events happening all over the place. Um, and, you know, so I'm, I would be really for it. Steve. Yeah, so anything to make the act of farming more sustainable, I think we should support. So if it's an accessory use that can bring in cash some way without displacing the actual farming, we should try to support it. So. Um, across the river, there are a number of farms, or at least I can think of two, that's a number, or three actually, that um, are also active wedding, posters of weddings, weddings and those kinds of events. And some of them are booked out five years. So I don't know who plans a wedding five years from now, but apparently somebody is. Yeah. So, and these are great cash flow for these farms. And they're great you know, economic stability. And so the, the caveat is so you don't want the parking or the mm -hmm. event space to displace the actual farm yeah. production. Yeah. I think Dave, you had a quick hand up. I know we don't want to get it too far into the weeds and I, I agree with everything. This really falls into that. What I was saying earlier is we need to work creatively with the farming community 
to help them be more prosperous, more successful. I, I, I like what you said there, Steve. Find ways to encourage more creative uses without displacing um, anything happening on tillable land. And that goes to back to what you asked about that realtor, Janet. And I always take almost everything realtors say with a little bit of a grain of salt because they're trying to sell a property um, or help, help somebody buy it. Um, and so every APR is unique in the Commonwealth and many of them had exclusions where the farmstead is excluded from the actual protected land. I know that the former Mad Woman Farm, uh, there may even be a, a house lot associated with it, I can't remember, but um, what can happen on the APR is very specific. It's less controlled what can happen on the, um, the excluded portion, that really falls to zoning. I would add one thing to what Steve said is, I do think there is a, it's, it's, it's an art and, and um, it's more of an art than science, but what is the right amount of creative other uses on a farm? For instance, let me compare Mad Woman's location with Maplewood Farm. Maplewood Farm is on a state road with probably 30 to 40,000 cars that come into our community every day. Adding traffic to Route 9 probably isn't going to affect the neighbors much, you know, although they should have a say in that on Route 9. However, you know, Mad Woman Farm on Southeast Street, adding more traffic to Southeast Street, adding uh, concentrated for, say, weddings or uh, kind of like what they've done up in Sunderland, the uh, maze, you know, the Mike's maze, clearly adds value to the farm and helps those farmers be profitable. But I do think there is an art to, and a sweet spot there, how much is enough, how much is too much. So I think I need, that's what we have great planners for, that's what we have a planning board and zoning board, that's what we can all do is put our heads together and help farmers um, be more successful and help our community. It enhances our community, all these wonderful, neat attributes like mazes and hay rides and, and breweries. Breweries are cropping up all over when in fact Maplewood Farm was one of the first breweries in New England and certainly in Massachusetts and here it sits vacant for how many years? Yeah, I just, oh, oh, oh Pat. I guess I'm curious and, and again I'm taking us off but why has it? Why haven't these changes been made? Even if it were a special permit for that particular farm, what? It's it's a long story, Pat. We may want to do that one offline. And we have tried the planning department, and we've we we spent many many hours trying to get that going. And we can fill you in on that. And we're we're still open to trying. We want to activate that property with, yeah, of course, because the beer was good and the yeah. duck was wonderful. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, um, when you're talking about Mike's Maze in Sunderland, um, that the farmland, that's a row of beautiful old houses and the farms are in back. Um, and my daughter does Chili Fest at Mark, uh, uh, Mike's Maze every year. And at the Chili Fest, there are every year more and more local breweries with their own stands selling beer. I mean, it's, it's where you come and see all kinds of things that are happening, um, including young musical acts. So. Somehow, it is in a very beautiful residential neighborhood. I mean, I was just thinking about that when you're talking about how does it displace the residentials, and I guess nobody minds, maybe because it is basically a farming community. I don't know. I'm sure people mind, but they've come to get to know it, and again, if it was 10,000 people coming on a weekend, that might tip the scales, but Mike's Maze is open all throughout the fall, and I think people come to realize the value of, of supporting local businesses. And I, I agree with lots of kernels, uh, pieces of what everybody has said here. I think we've, we've just got to roll up our sleeves and, and try to work with the farming community even more uh, to do that. I would, did want to mention also the select board in 2015, 16, um, made some adjustments to their approval to the farmer's market. Because for many years, what we heard from Amherst farmers is, they were reporting to us and the Agricultural Commission that they couldn't get into the Amherst Farmers Market. That, and if you notice, the composition of the Amherst Farmers Market is still probably 80% non-Amherst farmers. However, the select board, in their approval, 
back a few years ago, and, and Andy was, was a, 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 an important part of that, said, you need to make sure that Amherst farmers have the right, any mm -hmm. legitimate Amherst farmer should be able to get into our Amherst farmers market on town property in our town center. So steps like that are really well received by the farming community. I'm finding this conversation really rich and interesting, and I'm so oh, happy yeah. to hear from yes, you about what you think. Um, but I th suggest that we just do one more item here, and then I need mm -hmm. to go to my 4 o'clock meeting. And, um, but I'll be happy to come back at a future date and continue on in whatever format you think would be useful. Um, so the next one has to do with APRs. Continue to acquire APRs, agricultural preservation restrictions, and buy development rights on critical farmland. So we have bought a lot of APRs with the help of the state. I think the state pays most of the uh, amount and the town pays, I don't know, 10, 20 percent, something like that. Again, Mr. Zomek would be more um, conversant on this, but we do have a lot of APR land in town and in some cases it's actually not worked in the benefit of the landowner because um, it is, the APR is so restricted that they can't really do much beyond their little um, excluded area and in some early APRs they didn't even exclude the farmhouse so they're they're very limited about what they can do but perhaps Mr. Zomek can talk about that a little more. Do you have, do you have anything more to add on that one? Okay. I, I don't given the time I think okay. you know moving through these items. Okay and there's no there's no retroactive um, excluding the farmhouse for the earlier APRs? You have to go through a, in a process with the state, and it involves the legislature, mm -hmm. and it involves um, trading. I think it's two for one. You have to find property elsewhere that you put oh. under APR to accommodate the, or you know, yeah. to mitigate yeah. against the uh, impact of the what you're taking out of APR. So, so I will be happy to come back and continue to talk to you about this when, um, when you're ready. Well, I, I really appreciate uh, what you're doing, um, and I, I understand Pat's comment, um, but if this document is to become what we want it to become, it may in fact be a long, slow process, mm -hmm. because we don't want to just skim over things. Um, right, and Christine is right that it, was, it is a rich conversation that we were having. But I think then we have to look at how often we're meeting and other things to make right. this process a, a viable process that, that, so that we can then begin. Mm -hmm. Well, I think at this point, I'd really like to turn the meeting over to the chair, because um, <laughs> we're talking about um, meeting times. And uh, I think that is a good segue, because we want to finish up, because I know that Darcy's waiting for the room. Yeah. Thank you. Me, I wanted to. Uh, Thank you, Chris, for the notes that you took from the last meeting and the yeah. thorough way that you're going through this. And I think that what we need to do is a process, but not right now because you're leaving, is think about how we're going to go and capture all of the thinking and discussion that has gone on on each of these uh, pieces of the master plan so that it can be cataloged and then presented back to the counselor wherever it is appropriate to go so that they get the benefit of our thinking and our discussion that has taken place it really has been very valuable. And uh, since Darcy is here, I'll mention that uh, I'd spoken with her on the subject that we discussed very much at the beginning of this meeting um, about the need to be thinking about uh, those portions of the uh, master plan that overlap in this case with ECAC, but that was by way of example to others because I think we also need to think then about how we involve other boards and committees and commissions like ECAC so that we have the best thinking going into each of the sections uh, of the plan. Thank you so much. 
Thank you. Um, can I just? Yes. Thanks. Um, I wonder if you want someone from the planning board or a few people from the planning board to sit with you too. I'm I'm just here in my new and over eager capacity. <laughs> I'm not I'm not here in an official capacity, but it just seems like you know we're going through the master plan, mm -hmm. and there's a you know wealth of information and exchange. Well, I really appreciated your comments, so well, thank um, you. <laughs> you're not being over eager. You're, you may be eager, but not over eager. <laughs> Maybe in two years, I'll be like, eh, I'm done. <laughs> I'm here in my old and tired capacity. <laughs> so, so to, you want me to? Yeah. So, so, um, so that wraps up for today, the discussion of the master plan. I think it would be helpful if we could just keep working our way through at you know, at future meetings. So regarding future agenda items, um, Wayling Greedy had contacted both of us regarding mm -hmm. discussing the Amherst Community Connection, I believe. Right, what, and the homelessness problem. The homelessness yeah. problem. Yeah. And I had um, thought she had wanted to speak today, so I quickly put that onto the agenda under the wrong <coughs> I messed up a bunch of things, but we, I'd like to invite her to come to mm -hmm. our next meeting, which we have to decide you know, when that is. So I'm getting into a period where you know, school is starting to <coughs> be starting for Dorothy, yes. starting back up. Yep. So I can no longer meet in this time slot. Um, Do you know this time slot? I, I, I teach on no. um, Monday, Wednesday. Wednesday, one to oh, it's four, Monday, basically. Wednesday, okay. So, are you are, in the morning before class? You really don't want to have a meeting, do you? I could certainly meet Wednesday mornings, but we already have GOL Wednesday mornings. Okay. So then, what about Monday mornings? See, I'm teaching Tuesday, Thursday, nine thirty to about two. So, so I think Monday mornings would work for Monday me. Monday mornings. No, no good. Work for me. I have a regular appointment. Yeah. Okay. okay. And we don't have Sarah here, so how should we? Should I do a doodle? How about if I tried the Debbie yeah. Doodle poll as to what are... And are Fridays possible for, for people? Friday, I uh, have Auburn Bylaw Review and then I have Mr. Bartle from the Senate 11 to 3. So Fridays from now to... Okay. Which GOL starts at... GOL starts at 10.30. What about a... Um, what about Thursdays could be possible. The other one I was going to suggest is to. Wednesday, or even before GOL. Like 8.30? Yeah. 8.30 to 10.30? Thursday I'm teaching from 9.30 to oh, 2. I'm yeah. Sorry. So it's What about Wednesday mornings? Yeah, I didn't hear. Wednesday mornings, didn't you just say you didn't have Wednesday mornings? Stephen, I like the idea of a doodle poll doodle just poll. because then it gives people time to look at their schedules yeah, and, yeah. Mm -hmm. and it really becomes crystal clear who overlaps where and having Sarah, you know, um, right. do the doodle so, poll uh, as well. I'll, I'll generate a doodle poll and I'll start okay. with my own okay. restrictions and I'll try to find two hour blocks. I'm responding to what Pat said. Uh, first of all, she wanted to talk about uh, the process and we, we've talked about how long is it going to take us to do the master plan. Is it possible to meet more than twice a month? Yeah. I, I just feel that this is so important, yeah. but it takes time. And, and just keep learning things. Uh, it's, it's yeah, we're going to have the uh, zoning person for our bylaw come to us. Yeah. Um, so I, I, we're gonna, I, I really want to balance it because today was very, very valuable. What else we have to do and moving forward, yeah. So w we know we have um, the percent for art by law. We have the housing product, the housing um, study that will be referred to us. So we're going to start to get other things referred to us. In the fall, we're expecting some zoning bylaw changes from the planning mm -hmm. board. So every week is really hard for me. So I, I should just flat out say that just mm -hmm. because of yeah. other committees plus other jobs. Mm -hmm. So I would prefer longer twice a month. Okay. I might suggest something 
in, in the way we structure the meetings, um, Steve, and, and clearly there are things that are gonna be referred by the council to the CRC, and maybe it makes sense for us to kind of break up the agenda into kind of action items yeah. versus ongoing. So master plan review is gonna be kind of an ongoing thing. We know there will be action needed on it, but it won't be for some months is all likely. Whereas the council is gonna be looking for a recommendation on percent for art, any zoning that comes their way, the council's way. Um, what was the other one you just mentioned? A housing study? What's the? Uh, the, um, uh, the uh, uh, um, John Hornick, um, the new affordable housing. Oh, study. okay. Yeah. We just got this funding. Um, there may be some additional, there may be other asks oh. related to parking. Parking yep. or um, there may be some other funding requests that we all know might be coming down the, the way. So those will be action items mm -hmm. and then and those will need to be addressed quickly, efficiently, and sent back up to the council. Okay. And and maybe we look at the agenda that way and have the action mm -hmm. items. We might even front load the agenda items so we know we get them done and then have these ongoing discussions be the second half of the meeting or something like that. I like that idea because I don't want to lose the conversation. That's the hard part about mm -hmm. saying yeah. let's move on. Um, there's one other possibility. I'll just throw it out there. Um, three meetings a month. One, one that's specific, not that we wouldn't look at the master plan in the way that we're trying, you know, after action mm -hmm. items, but that we had one meeting a month that was only the master plan. Is that possibility temporarily, and it would be a temporary thing. It wouldn't. Uh, if it's not, it's so yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's so I I could handle it because the craziness of this last semester is over. We're now it's a big slog we're in right now, but we know what we're doing. So I'm feeling more confident, and I'm doing a masterful job, I believe, of organizing my classwork ahead of time so that I can, you know, getting all my materials ready, everything, so, but I, I don't Yeah, know. I think what's critical for us is to figure out what to do with all of this review of the master plan. Mm -hmm. So right now we're really, it's a conversation, but the expectation is that we'll we will be taking a lead or at least mm -hmm. advising the council on how it wants to you know, get involved with the master plan review. So in a way, what we're doing is the prelude to a bigger conversation that will involve more of us. Um, three times a week is hard, yeah. you know, but it's not all about me. But, no. but um, we don't have to have all of us here all the time. So if I simply can't do it, um, like, so I mean, we're actually many of the committees are starting to operate without perfect attendance, right? So we could certainly do that if we get if we're okay with not perfect attendance. Well, put that on the doodle poll. Not yeah. that I know how to yep. design a doodle poll. I have learned how to answer a doodle poll. And that's that's about where I am now. I was just thinking, what we really need is a scribe for all of our master plan discussion, yeah. and uh, where. The notes are all, I mean, I have my notes, each of us has their notes, but we'd, if we just had some good, yeah, Dave. I'm trying not to take on too much, but I'm trying to relieve a little bit of, I, I, I sense and I appreciate your stress about the master plan. I do, th I really firmly believe that if we restructure the meetings a little bit, mm -hmm you are and we are gonna be able to respond to what the council needs your action on immediately mm -hmm. by their next meeting or by two meetings from there. I will say that I think Chris and her staff, their, Chris takes copious notes on yeah. the master plan in this discussion. So I think it's incumbent upon me and with Chris's help to mm -hmm. propose to you a spreadsheet or something on the master plan to say here you know um, it might be you know here's goal goal one from 2010 mm -hmm. um, 
no action needed, you know, whatever it might be. Action needed, no action needed, what that action is, um, and come back to you. So I think it's incumbent upon staff to come to you with the master plan, all the feedback you give us, and let, if you would, let us organize it and present it to you and say, is this what you meant by you wanted, you wanted changes to this goal, we, uh, sustainability. We need sustainability infused throughout the document. You tell us where you'd like it, and we will, we will uh, note that in a new kind of a master plan action document, whatever that might be. So I don't know exactly how this is going to take shape, but I want to I want to allay some of your fears about who's going to who's going to take all that in. I think Chris yeah. will take it in. We'll give it back to you. Ultimately, it's up to you to then say. Where is this going? Is it going to the, ultimately it goes to the council. So, um, and I think it's really important that, you know, Steve, uh, last night um, we were talking about the, um, the dog park. Uh, and so the council referred that to you. It came to you. Um, I think you did your, th your thing. It went back up. I think the only thing, and, and again, I was on vacation, they wanted something written. Uh, so every time they want something, a memo from the committee back up to them is, is my guess. That, that's what they want. So if that's helpful, I think we can take on some of that and, and present it to you uh, in, in your own words as to what, what you wanted on section X, Y, or Z. Okay. So. I, I think that sounds wonderful. Does that sound good to everybody else? Yeah. And we'd have a chance to see it printed, so we could go run through our notes and say, yeah, 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 yeah. oh, if they've got this, yeah. I think mm -hmm. that really gives us a better sense of control, because it's, right. it is overwhelming. It's overwhelming. But I don't want to slight, I don't want to slight what we're doing, because yeah. I think it's, it's really crucial. And let, let's all keep in mind, I think over 600 people participated in the meetings for the master plan. It took years mm -hmm. to put together, and this isn't going to happen overnight, a rewrite or an update. Yeah. It's a lot of work for all of us, so yeah. we're going to need, all need to be a little patient on how we get there. Okay. All right. So, is there anything else? Or is there, we go to the group? So, I guess I should say we have no more meetings scheduled right now, and so the next meeting will be in September um, on a date, okay. and I would assume in the first week in September on a date yeah. that we can agree on yeah. via do dutiful. Or, you all could meet the first Wednesday. So we've been on this first and third Wednesday. You all could meet on the first Wednesday of September without me. You all meet in the morning every other week. We could take the week off. Oh, that's true. That's a good point. Yeah. So their, let me see, where are we? Where, their next meeting is the um, fourth. And what if our next meeting is the twenty? So the, the Wednesdays are the 4th, 11th, 18th, and 25th of September? Yeah, that's what they were. And She's saying switch the week so that it's not the same week as the GOL meeting. Yeah. So it's a, yeah. Uh, odd thing with the GOL meeting two weeks in a row, but that's unusual. As a concept, does, and then we don't have Sarah here, but as a concept, all those from which Wednesday from the 1030 to 1230 o'clock? Or even earlier. Or even earlier? Yeah, 9.30. Yeah, 9.30, I think, is a, is, a, is a good time to start. And then the next year, we could discuss what the OL schedule is, because yeah. I have that little funny thread for a meeting two weeks in a row. Yeah. So you're just, uh, and this is before the poll, you're thinking it might be the 28th and then the... Yeah, we might agree not... Then, and the, then the 11th, possibly. Yeah, except okay. we'll have a meeting. At least mm -hmm. I have it in my book. Meeting yeah, on the fourth, the fourth. Okay, right. which is one problem, which would be the special meeting. Mm. So, w were you proposing to meet next week, which is the twenty eighth, or or would we? 
every other week, obviously the CLO got a tremendous boost. Ah, uh, I see. But then there is this funny glitch where we're back on the 11 system. So maybe, uh, I don't know. I see Andy wanting to say something. But maybe um, just if he, yeah. he's thinking. Yeah, no, the problem that I have is I have a bunch of uh, travel dates that coincide with Wednesdays during the next uh, month, and uh, that's a rare circumstance. Um, mm -hmm. And so the question is coming to a long-term resolution in principal meeting on Wednesday mornings in general terms, other than the travel conflicts is fine. So are you saying that, that perhaps for the next month, um, a, a Monday morning or some other time would be better? Because you're going to be busy. You're not going to be able to make Wednesday mornings, most of them. Is that it? The ones where I'm out of town, I'm out of town. Uh, so I, it sort of requires a week-by-week -week presentation, mm -hmm. and I don't yeah. want to do that. Okay. And I don't have Monday morning. Okay. So, so well, that's why the circulating uh, around Wednesday morning, but also not a good thing because we don't have sales and such. We could put in um, the finance is going to be maybe at two thirty on Tuesdays or two or two thirty on Tuesdays. So then Thursday might have a two or two thirty possibility for a meeting for CRC Thursday. Thursday's open. Uh, yeah. So I go out of town a fair amount. Okay. Thursday's so Thursday Sunday. Yeah, okay. So that's not good. But okay. um, one of the one of the hopes with meeting Wednesday afternoons was that we would mesh with the planning board's zoning subcommittee, which meets Wednesdays mm -hmm. at five. So ending our meetings at four thirty seemed like a segue to those for who wanted to attend. Yeah, I so, think that is a good point. Yeah. Uh, let's, we yeah. might have to. I think we're going to have to do the doodle poll. Doodle poll plus and another conversation. Yeah, I, I, but I think that you need to think about how to construct the doodle poll because it's a question also of short term and long term. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're asking for people to come up with a good, what is a good long term time, and then the second question is, during the next month because yeah, um, yeah. people have made commitments for the next month. Mm -hmm. Are there any exceptions that you just want to note? And we'll just have to do as best we can. Uh, but we've sort of been meeting with only four people here for a while and sort of a five person committee that's right on the edge. Um, and then I want to touch on minutes for a well, One of the things that might be helpful is if each one of us types to when we're available in September. Yeah, just because, generally. And yeah. then I like the idea, Andy, of, of looking after that for the doodle poll page or something. I don't know. But if you have that information, and I, if one person has that information, mm -hmm. it would maybe be helpful mm -hmm. for September. Yep, just for September. Yep. Yeah, the other thing I was going to then changing subject is that I had sent out that one set of minutes. There was another set of minutes that I didn't send to you, Steve, and that would, nothing happened with them. Um, I don't know how we're dealing with minutes to make sure that they get approved and then get posted, um, but you as chair could approve the minutes without bringing them back to the committee. So our, our I think we approved the practice that um, I sent out the draft minutes and all of you can comment, and if you don't comment, they're automatically approved. And then, um, that's true. I, they should get posted to chair summit. Yeah. Now so, that yeah. We're, and also, like our meeting agenda, if we could get that on chair summit so it's on. Um, I've got to stop being a Luddite here. I'm sorry, what did you say? I'm a Luddite. I'm a SharePoint Luddite. Oh. Um, Dave, we need some help on SharePoint. Well, Sarah could do it. It's just going to help me. We will have trouble with it. <laughs> no. Yeah. We don't, 
we don't know how to post our minutes to SharePoint. Um, Sarah knows. We can buy, we can, she's on the committee. So let's ask her okay. before we bother Dave. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is there a good 